You are now listening to the Purple Fox Podcast. Update! What's going on, everybody? This is Kevin Neze, your host of the Purple Fox Podcast. And this episode is on how Peter Obi could elevate Nigeria to global power status. Now, the globalized world as we know it is shifting. Um, Those of us who are paying attention can see the glimpses of new global powers on the horizon. New alliances are being formed and every sovereign sovereign nation is going to have to take a long, hard look at its standing in the world order, uh, especially within the next 10 years. One nation that has the potential to rise as a leader in the coming age is Nigeria, a country with a population of 206 million and a $1.28 trillion GDP. However, there are certain conditions Nigeria will have to meet before it can assume that status. That is why the upcoming 2023 presidential election is uh, one of the most crucial elections uh, since it received its independence in 1960. It's a very important one. In the midst of a crucial election cycle with so much on the line in terms of global interests, Nigerian, the Nigerian political scene seems to be pumping more of the same old, same old politicians with the exception of one. Uh, one former governor of Anambra State, Peter Obi. In a Business Day article by Iwok Inyobong, uh, Peter Obi states that, quote, it is time for Nigerians to bring in a competent leader to start rebuilding the country and change the narrative, lamenting the only bad news ruling the airwaves in the country because of bad governance and uh, irresponsible leadership. Um, Inyo Bong also writes on former Governor Obi's achievements um, as the sitting governor of Anambra State, writing that the presidential aspirant grew the state's GDP substantially and left no debt. It's pretty impressive. Uh, Ob- uh, governor Obi lays out his desire to focus on criminality and national debt in the article, two of his major priorities once he assumes the office of presidency. And he plans to do this by creating jobs. Quote, taking that step would reduce criminality in the country. You must create jobs. The more you push jobs out, the more you reduce criminality. It is an economic problem and we must do something about it. The number of people that are supposed to be working is not the number. Out of 120 million, only 40 million are currently working, end quote. Now, are his claims coming from nowhere or does he have a legitimate point about the potentially uh, the potential majority black superpower? Um, Let's let's take a look at some of the financials of the country. According to the IMF or the International Monetary Fund, within the last or the latest sub-Saharan African Regional Economic Outlook report, uh, the country may be spending 100 percent of its revenue on debt servicing by 2026, 100%. Wow, Uh, Nigeria currently spends 89% on its revenue, uh, of its revenue on debt. Mix that together with low nationwide revenue and you get what the IMF's resident representative for Nigeria, Ari Aizen, describes as an existential issue for the country. Aizen most notably remarked on Nigeria's inability to take advantage of the current global high oil prices to build reserves, which which doesn't make sense to me. If if they were ready, if they were ready ready with their oil capacity uh, when when Russia hit Ukraine and and everyone was scouring for a way to both hit Russia with with sanctions and make sure that the supply of global oil didn't, you know, hinge on on uh, OPEC. Nigeria will be right there ready, because as I'll discuss later, they have the capacity to produce that kind of oil. Uh, they just don't have the refining capacity. Um, and the fuel subsidy payments, which at the current rate of 500 billion Naira a month is projected to hit a record 6 trillion Naira by the end of the year. 
all of which threatened to plunge the country into a freefall. But this issue isn't something that sprung up out of nowhere. Um, so Naira being the, the currency of Nigeria, um, I believe it's about, uh, I believe right now, it's probably about 440 to the dollar, the US dollar. So it's, it's a, if you, if you went there, you, you do a, some would be balling. An editorial in an outlet called The Nation lays out the situation well, stating, quote, long before the problem was allowed to metastasize and perhaps long before the IMF woke up to the realization, Nigerians are on record to have spoken loud and clear on the need to not, uh, not just for the government to fix the nation's four refineries, but also to expand the refining capacity ditto to the ancillary infrastructure that serviced the nation, the national fuel distribution system on which the nation had heavily invested, end quote. According to Simbi Wabote, the executive secretary of the Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board, the current administration has set a target of increasing domestic refining capacity to 1.4 million barrels per day in the next five years tapping 400,000 from NNPC refineries in Port Harcourt, Kaduna, and Wari, uh, 650,000 from the Dangote refinery in Lagos, and 200,000 from the BUA refinery in Akwaibon. This plan hinges on the effectiveness of the Petroleum Industry Act, which is supposed to have introduced a governance framework for the industry with clear outlining of roles between uh, regulation, and profit-centric business units. Uh, in a Brookings art article by Kasirim Nuoke uh, entitled, Nigeria's Petroleum Industry Act, Addressing Old Problems, Creating New Ones. The Petroleum Industry Act, or PIA, is presented as a law that replaced the regulation and governance of the oil and gas industry, splitting it into the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission and the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority. This act was mostly put in place to make sure there are two bodies of oversight inspecting both the technical and the commercial regulations of petroleum operations, also giving them the power to acquire, hold, and dispose of property, as well as uh, the power to sue and be sued in their own name. Uh, that's important. So the legislature, they took a look at this bill and they were like, okay, we need to make sure we delineate all the roles and we know exactly who to come after if this thing fails. Um, so so uh, the roles are outlined and delineated. Um, they can acquire property, hold property, dispose of property, and we know who's responsible, which is the most important thing. Because before it was like this one big hodgepodge that was just very inefficient. Uh, Nuoke writes, quote, one of the more controversial, controversial stipulations in the PIA or the Petroleum Industry Act is the provision stating that in the event of supply shortfalls, only companies with active refining licenses or a proven track record of international crude oil and petroleum products trading will be allowed to import such products, end quote. Um, and many have taken this as a clear sign of an attempt to give monopoly powers to a select few domestic refiners, and it kind of lends itself to the um, to the stories you hear about how how uh, many find the atmosphere of Nigeria to be to be anti entrepreneurial. You know that that spirit kind of crushes investment and and that kind of drive to do more to to innovate in the country. Um, the the Petroleum Industry Act also stipulates that existing host communities. Housing these projects must receive an annual contribution equal to 3% of the petroleum project's operating expenditure uh, for the previous year of operations. And the management committee of the trust must include um, one member of the host community. So one member of the host community has to be on the uh, management committee. Uh, the act also put a penalty for failure to pay the host community, including pulling the project license. Many people cite the ambiguous language within a Petroleum Industry Act. 
um, specifically the host community trust reimbursement. They don't really think they're 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 going to pay them these 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 dues. They're just finding clever language around it so that they can claim, oh, that's not really what it says. Um, and this is creating uncertainty and even grounds for future conflicts. Um, what's interesting is that during the, re the the structuring phase of the Petroleum Industry Act, uh, one former uh, Anambra state governor, Peter Obi, argued that the host communities from which Nigeria generated a major part of her revenue deserved more than the 3% agreed upon within the act. Obi fought for host communities to receive a just sum equal to the level of environmental impact and resource extraction, saying, quote, the Petroleum Industry Act is needed, but I thought we could have considered a the 5% being demanded by the host communities. We must learn to care for those generating resources for us, whether it's petroleum or uh, VAT, which is value added tax. We should consider supporting communities that are generating resources that we are sharing, end quote. Now, OB stated there was little to show for the nation borrowing and growing its debt profile, uh, suggesting that Nigeria was borrowing more for consumption rather than investment, uh, a situation he described as improper and continuously unhealthy for the nation's economy. Quote, debt is not bad, but if we borrow for consumption, debt is bad. Nigeria is borrowing for consumption. They claim that the money being borrowed is being invested, but I ask, where is the investment? If you have invested it, the economy would be doing better, but the economy is worse, which means the money borrowed, you threw it away. We should borrow and invest, that is to invest in the proper thing. What develops a nation is an education, health, and pulling people out of poverty. End quote. And so far, OB's statements have been proven true, considering the amount of human abductions for ransom money, illegal crude oil theft, and skyrocketing unemployment within the country. According to the Organized Crime and Corrupt Reporting Project, Nigeria, albeit, albeit Africa's leading oil producer, imports, imports, more than 90% of domestically consumed oil. That's the oil they consume themselves. They're importing more than 90% of it. The paradox is that Nigeria has failed to develop the domestic oil processing capacity, despite large sums of money being poured into prospective refineries. Again, former uh, governor of Anambra State, Peter Obi, asking, where is the investment? Where is the investment? Uh, this hikes up the price of oil on the official market, making it unaffordable for many within the country. The current APC party administration began clamping down on illegal oil refineries since 2021, when the military destroyed a total of 1,423 refineries. Um, those involved in oil theft, a risky endeavor by any stretch of the imagination, uh, often see their activities as necessary because of the dire situation uh, in their regions of the country. Uh, an owner operator of an illegal refinery told Sky News, quote, we do it because we have no jobs, understand? End quote. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, you, you do what you have to do to feed your family, right? It's a given. The OCCRP report goes on to state that the massive pollution caused by oil, oil drilling uh, has disrupted farming and fishing, two main sources of income in the region. However, local communities have seen very little of the wealth generated by the industry, which is dominated by international oil companies. It has yet to be seen whether that 3% contribution promised within the Petroleum Industry Act will bear any fruit for the stakeholder communities being drained of their resources. Meanwhile, unemployed, un unemployment remains high and poverty is soaring. The APC and PDP, uh, two of the ruling duopoly parties within the country, have mostly been concerned with catering to elites and their political futures while leaving the rest of the country to fend for themselves. I'm sure some of us in the US will be very familiar with that kind of uh, situation. 
Uh, the current administration refuses to fund key drivers that could potentially lead to a robust economy. Spending on health was just 3%, 3% of Nigeria's GDP, in, uh, according to the last figures from the World Bank, compared to 9% from South Africa. In the past five years, Nigeria allocated between 6 to 8% of public expenditures to education. 6 to 8%, below uh, UNESCO's recommended 15 to 20%. With inflation on the rise in a globalized marketplace, unemployment surging and food costs soaring, it's no wonder former governor uh, of Anambra State, Peter Obi, is laser focused on job creation and investment in the neglected fields that will pull the people of Nigeria out of poverty and into thriving success. It feels like the people, especially the youth of Nigeria, are asking for leadership that can lead them to a new age of prosperity. What kind of country maintains leadership that, that doesn't invest in its hospitals, instead preferring to fly to the UK before receiving treatment? What kind of country allows its infrastructure to suffer so drastically to the point where trucks with necessary goods flip over on the roads before reaching their destinations? What kind of country that desires to be taken seriously on the world stage limits the entrepreneurial spirit of its citizens and disenfranchises a young population of voters by procrastinating on a very crucial electoral process? The Nigerian populace is growing tired of leadership that cares more for the size of their pockets than the quality of education and resources their citizens are receiving in schools. If the APC and the PDP want to capture the hearts of the upcoming generations of passionate Nigerians, then they must get serious about fixing the issues that lessen the sense of pride in their nation and cast them as second fiddle to European nations. They hunger for Nigeria to become the first majority black superpower on this planet we call Earth. Who better to bring Nigeria into that era than a man, one former governor, Peter Obi, who has proven his proficiency with money management and good governance. Nigeria needs a leader with forethought to recognize when a country needs to look outside to find more functional models of success in a given field. Peter Obi's recent trip to Egypt came on the heels of a serious grid collapse leading to power outages in key cities. Amidst Nigeria's current fuel scarcity, former governor Peter Obi announced his departure for, uh, for Egypt to study the country's education, power, planning, and finance achievements. He announced a three-day trip on his official Twitter account, which attracted condemnation as well as criticism from friends and foes alike. According to the International Energy Agency, the EIA, Egypt has initiated a number of energy sector reforms, gradually reducing electricity subsidies and introducing feed-in tariffs to promote renewable energy production. Now, feed-in tariffs are, are policy tools designed to uh, promote investment in renewable energy sources. Uh, this usually means promising small-scale producers of energy, meaning uh, solar and wind, um, an above market price for what they deliver to the grid. The energy sector reforms recently initiated by the country of Egypt have resulted in a significant increase in investments, uh, which have boosted electricity production over the last five years and ensured a stable, emphasis on stable, supply across the country. Energy uh, uh, Egypt also has plans to increase the share of renewables in the electricity mix to 42% by 2035. Now, former Governor Peter Obi envisions a future where the renewables can work in tandem with the oil industry to revitalize Nigeria and create necessary jobs to satisfy many frustrated and unemployed young Nigerians. Despite the criticism, he decided to spend the time to understand what would be necessary for the country he wishes to serve. Wow. 
It's amazing to me that some find any other words besides commendable to describe such an act. Now, maybe if he were to block traffic with excessive motorcades and uh, toss money around, then some of his critics would uh, start to recognize the kind of politics that they adore, the useless kind. There is a call echoing within the hearts of ambitious young Nigerians. It is a desire to elect true leadership into the halls of Asso Rock. A leader who will truly serve the fatherland with the love of a mother, the strength of a warrior, and the faith of the sincerely devout. Nigeria has seen much change in the last 100 years. Uh, not long ago was the country liberated from the colonial presence. Uh, in the wake of that departure, Nigeria ventured into civil war, struggling with a tumultuous crisis of national identity. The labor of those fallen citizens and what they fought for on either side will never be forgotten. However, it is the dawn of a new age in Nigeria, and older generations should look to the example being set by their children and hope for the future. They are currently joining together to support a man they can see, they can see, has the actual interest of the people at heart. And in this way, in this way, they hope to elect into office one Peter Obi, a man who can genuinely manifest one nation, not in freedom, peace, and unity. So this is your host of the Purple Fox Podcast, Kevin C. Eze, signing out.